Good morning and welcome to the fifth edition of the Central Bank of Malta Annual Research Workshop. This workshop is our annual event in which we also launch the research bulletin. This bulletin will be uploaded on our website later today at the end of the workshop. In later addition to the bulletin, the volume, but not now. In addition to the bulletin, we have a, a very interesting program this morning. We will be discussing climate change, our modeling efforts here at the research department to include energy and environmental considerations into our modeling toolkit and also the results of a large scale survey on household finances and consumption pattern. We're very happy to have with us today Elisa Lanzi, a senior economist from the OECD, to deliver the keynote speech. We also have Noel Rapa and Massimo Giovannini from our research department and Valentina Antonaroli from the economic analysis department. Before I give the floor to the governor to deliver his introduction, let me go quickly through some of the housekeeping rules, even though I'm pretty sure that by now you're all very familiar with them. So can I please ask you to set your microphone to mute unless and until you are going to make an intervention? I would also ask that your camera is turned off. Unless you are going to speak as this makes the communication easier. There will be time set for Q&A. After each presentation, we will have around 15 minutes after each talk. You can indicate your desire to make an intervention by using the raise your hand button. You can also send a message in the chat, but I highly encourage you to ask the question directly yourself. Finally, the workshop will be recorded and posted on the website and social media channels as soon as possible. So if any of your colleagues are maybe interested in it, or in some of the presentations, they can do so later on at their convenience. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to the governor of the Central Bank of Malta, Professor Edward Cicluna, to give his introductory remarks. Thank you, Brian. Deputy governors, colleagues, distinguished speakers and distinguished guests, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this annual research uh, workshop and the launch of the research bulletin itself now in its 50, the fifth edition. The bulletin is our normal flagship research publication and is intended to showcase in a concise and approachable manner a selection of the bank's scientific research to make it available to a wider audience. As we all know, the world economy has been hit by severe shocks in recent years, which led to significant and widespread disruptions in economic activity that required large scale interventions by fiscal and monetary authorities. Um, the strong rebound in global demand coupled with shortages of key commodities in some sectors and disruptions in the logistics industry led, as we all know, to unprecedented inflationary pressures. Then these were added the rising energy and commodity prices, which were further fueled by the war uh, in Ukraine. Facing inflationary pressures not seen since the early 80s, central banks in several economies, including ours, the ECB, embarked on monetary policy normalization, or can say tightening, bringing to an end a period of very expansion in monetary policy. These developments have an inevitable impact on the Maltese economy, especially given its small size and very high degree of openness. The increasing complex research questions facing policy makers require now a diversified toolkit that consists of a broad suit of models and data sets. The Central Bank of Malta is one of the leading institutions for economic research in Malta and regularly publishes detailed studies on various aspects of the Maltese economy. Last year, the bank published a total of 40 different research outputs, ranging from research boxes or articles in its regular publications, policy notes, working papers, and studies in international peer review journals. The articles in the research bulletin provide a snapshot of the research conducted by staff in the economics division of our bank. The four articles chosen for this year's edition focus on the diverse topics. We've got the first article summarizing the main findings of the fourth wave of the household finance and consumption survey for Malta. The second article compares our internal advertised rental 
database with the rental contracts registered with the housing authority now. These two data sets differ in important characteristics, and since the late 21, 2021, the increase in growth rate of advertised rents has been significantly more pronounced compared to registered rents. This article shows too that one of the reasons for this gap is the inclusion of renewed contracts in the registered data sets, as more than 95% of these contracts in 2021 remained with the same rent as in the original contract. The third article uses one of the bank's structural models to estimate the macroeconomic effects of the Recovery and Resilience Facility Fund on the Maltese economy. The fund is part of the flagship of the EU program that was launched soon after the onset of COVID-19 pandemic to help EU governments to stimulate demand and restructure their economies by improving their infrastructure and facilities. The transition to a green and digitized economy, especially. Malta has been allocated almost um, uh, 200, 264 million uh, euro in this fund, which will be dispersed over a six year period. Finally, the fourth article documents the estimation of the bank's structural model, which features household heterogeneity, housing and borrowing constraints with state of the art Bayesian methods. This year, the bank has already published 11 policy notes or working papers on diverse topics, such as the impact of Brexit on Maltese firms, household saving patterns, the property market, monetary policy, and the labor market. All these studies are publicly available on the bank's website, which I encourage you to visit. Let me now briefly turn to the program of today's workshop. The keynote speech by Elisa Lanzi from the OECD focuses on the cost of environmental inaction and economic resilience. The presentation will provide an overview of the linkages between environmental inaction and economic growth, the impact of climate change and air pollution, the costs of environmental inaction, and the benefits from environmental policies. This is followed by a discussion from two of our economists from the research department on the bank's latest modeling efforts regarding climate and energy. In the first presentation, Noel Rapa will discuss how the bank's existing DSGE model is being augmented with an energy, energy block to internalize the effects that climate and energy are likely to have on the Maltese economy, capturing the country-specific features of Malta's energy um, generation. It will also feature a tax subsidy structure that could be used to study economic effects of fiscal incentives aimed at accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy. In the second presentation, Massimo Giovannini will discuss the development of a model for the Euro area and the rest of the world with energy and environmental features. This model facilitates the evaluation of the cost and benefits of alternative policies targeting, targeting greenhouse gas emission goals and the reduction of external energy dependency. I must admit that both modeling efforts are quite ambitious, but at the same time also needed to address policy relevant questions. In the final presentation, Valentina Antonaroli from the bank's economic analysis department will provide an overview of the main findings from the fourth wave of the household finance and consumption survey for, for Malta. The survey, which is coordinated by the European Central Bank, is held every three years and will provide essential information on Maltese households balance sheet with detailed information on their assets, liabilities, wealth and income. The results will also provide a glimpse of the impact of COVID pandemic on household balance sheets and finances as well. Plans are on hand to make the technical results of this survey more easily accessible to the general public. In conclusion, I must observe that in recent years, the bank has significantly increased its research output. The intention is to cement the bank's position as the leading institution for economic research on our island, in line with our statutory responsibilities, which allows the bank staff to actively participate and contribute to the policy debate at a local and European level. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Governor, for those introductory remarks. 
So may I remind you that the bulletin will be available on our website after the end of this workshop. So let me now turn to our guest speaker. Elisa Lanzi is a senior economist at the OECD Environmental Department, where she leads the modeling and outlook team. She has a PhD in economics from the University of Venice. She works on economic consequences of environmental policies on a range of issues, including climate change, air pollution, material use, plastics, and the transition to a more resource efficient and circular economy. She joined the OECD in 2010, and since then she has worked on several topics, including the cost of environmental inaction, competitiveness impacts of climate policies, and climate change adaptation. The title of her talk this morning is The Cost of Env Environmental Inaction and Economic Resilience. So Elisa, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. It's really an honor to be here and to be able to contribute to the discussions on climate change at the Central Bank of Malta. Uh, it's an increasing trend that central banks um, focus increasingly more on, um, on climate change and the environment. And this is a, um, a great thing because they can play a really key, uh, a key role in advancing on greening our economies. I will share my slide. If you can um, please confirm whether you can see the slides. Yes, we can see them. OK, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so as for the introduction, I'll be talking today about our uh, work on the socioeconomic consequences of environmental inaction, uh, economic resilience and benefits from policy action. Um, I'd like to clarify that I work at the OECD Environment Directorate um, and I lead a team of modelers. Um, so um, I have a couple of slides that might look a bit more technical, but um, I know uh, here I'm among the economists. In any case, if you are confused or anything, please don't hesitate to stop me uh, and ask me to clarify. So um, um, in the talk today, I'd like to start by highlighting the linkages between the economy and the environment. Uh, maybe going a bit beyond climate change. Uh, then drawing on our um, modeling work at the OECD, I'll explain a bit the um, work we do on costs of inaction and I'll focus on climate change, but also on air pollution. And I'll get to highlight why air pollution is also important uh, uh, at that point. Um, I'll explain a little bit what we've done in terms of uh, modeling progress to not just look at the cost of inaction, but also the uh, benefits from policy action. And then finally, I'll finish with going a bit beyond what we do at the OCD and explaining what modeling tools are out there to quantify interactions between the economy and uh, climate. Um, so to start off, why is it important to look at the linkages between the economy and the environment? Uh, the issue is that these two aspects are extremely closely linked and they are really two sides of a meadow. So on one hand, economic growth affects the environment and changes the states of the environment. Indeed, with growing populations, uh, growing income and changes um, in the structure of the economy, We've already heard talking about dig digitalization, um, but also uh, servitization affects um, affects the state of the environment as well, because as we rely more on services and um, the economies are automatically greening over time, we generally uh, move towards sectors that are less emission intensive. However, unfortunately, that hardly ever compensates for the pressure of the environment imposed by income growth, which leads to more demand for goods and therefore more production and population growth, which generally is linked to um, heavier use of uh, land and resources. On the other hand, uh, the state of the environment can actually uh, pose issues and limit um, economic activity and therefore economic growth. Indeed, Whenever we produce something, uh, all economic activities rely on the availability of materials. We've just seen recently with the um, situation in uh, Ukraine and the increase in the price of energy and actually also availability of fossil fuels 
uh, that that can put heavy um, heavy toll on the economy and on uh, production, and therefore uh, leading to inflation and uh, and higher prices affecting consumer uh, behavior. Um, the, on the other hand, we also have environmental damages that can cause problems to um, economic activity. So these are, for instance, disruptions from climate change, but uh, also from other environmental issues. Uh, to give you a few examples of what I mean with um, uh, environmental damages, uh, when we look at climate change, there can be heavy disruptions to production that come, for instance, from water supply shortages. Um, just the summer in Italy, it's been a huge problem. There was no water in the uh, Po River, and um, as a consequence, they couldn't. Um, uh, the, the whole agricultural sector was quite stuck, and um, agricultural prices, uh, food prices, went up um, even more. So uh, that's just one clear example of a climate-related disruption. There can also be heavy damages to infrastructure that can affect. Um, production in the long run or sometimes in the short run. Uh, these can come, for instance, from flooding, um, so from uh, some short term climate episodes, uh, but also more in the long run. For instance, when we look at um, the efficiency of um, train uh, transportation, for instance, every summer it can become less efficient as temperatures go up in the summer, for instance. That happens quite often, actually, in the Paris region, even if we're up north. Uh, when we look at air pollution, the link to the economy can go through labor productivity, as there are um, increasing amounts of air pollution related illnesses, such as asthma, but also bronchitis. Um, that leads to more absences from work, and in the long term, that leads to um, in aggregate, uh, a lower labor productivity affecting um, the economy. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, increasing expenditures on health, uh, which basically um, have consumers deviate from their optimal expenditure uh, choices uh, as they spend more on health care and less on um, more desirable goods. Um, materials is, of course, is an extremely strong link to the economy as uh, material shortages can affect uh, production. Um, other examples recently have been on car industries being stuck um, due to uh, material sh shortages. Um, but uh, one other interesting aspect is when, for instance, the demand for tourism can decrease due to issues of unmanaged waste. Uh, for this, plastics is an example, as we have more and more of our beautiful beaches in the Mediterranean being invaded with uh, plastic waste or waste of all sorts. Um, that, in the short or long run, can actually have uh, consequences in the demand for tourism. And then, uh, finally, another example is looking at biodiversity. So when uh, ecosystem services become lacking, that can have uh, then can badly influence the uh, economic production in some key sectors, especially agriculture ones. Um, so given that introduction, I'd now like to zoom in on the modeling work we do. So how how do we translate these ideas in practice in a, a quantification of the link? Uh, between economic growth and environmental uh, damages. We have uh, quite a history of uh, modeling on this topic at the OECD Environments Directorate. Uh, we've been doing modeling work relying on computable general equilibrium models since the 1990s, uh, initially with um, uh, what was called the Green Model, uh, which has been renamed uh, in the 2000s uh, as EMV linkages, and that's the model we currently work on. Uh, why the choice of a CG model, uh, which I know differentiates, um, for instance, from the choice uh, central banks usually make? Uh, it's for two main reasons. First of all, we um, aim to have sectoral details uh, because they're needed to assess the environmental impacts of economic activity, uh, which is not homogenous across sectors. For instance, when you look at emission intensity or emission sources, they largely vary across sectors, and it's really important to have uh, those distinctions to be able to identify emission sources and the policies that need to 
we put in place to uh, decrease emissions uh, for each respective source. Um, the other reason for looking at a CG model is um, that we were aimed, uh, we aim at having a long term analysis to study environmental changes. That's important for topics um, as climate change, for instance, because um, the long term the long term consequences determine also what we need to do at the present state. So uh, when you look at climate analysis, very often you uh, you work backwards. So you say you want to achieve, for instance, net zero emission by 2050 and you work backwards to see uh, what needs to be done now to achieve such uh, goals. So these are the main motivations for uh, the choice of a modeling approach. Um, so uh, just to give you a bit of background on what uh, our model looks like, uh, EMV linkages is a computable general equilibrium model uh, which works at the global level and is divided in uh, <clears throat> several global uh, regions. Um, and on average, we have 25 regions, but um, the regional aggregation is flexible and we've been working increasingly with um, also isolating single countries or specific regions to be able to uh, provide more detailed uh, information um, at times also to countries. Um, it's a multi-sectoral model, as I said, that's quite key to our type of analysis. Again, the sectoral aggregation is uh, flexible and uh, we adjust it according to the project. So for instance, when working on plastic uh, or climate, we don't focus on the same um, on the same sectors, but uh, there is a full description of economies um, which remains throughout the project. Um, so indeed, the model is based on a series of social accounting matrices, which are linked then through international trade flows. Um, the model is based on structural trends as it looks, as I said, to the long run, and it doesn't take into account uh, business uh, cycles. So it is not the best uh, type of model when you're looking at uh, short term disruptions caused, for instance, by um, new environmental policies. Although we do try to reflect um, short term disruptions in our baseline calibration. So, for instance, we have uh, taken into account the COVID shocks. Um, and more recently, to a certain extent, the um, Ukraine uh, situation. Uh, in terms of dynamics, the model is so solved um, iteratively over time, so it's a recursive dynamic model, and the time horizon is generally to um, 2060 at the maximum, but at times we also focus more on the uh, shorter term. Um, one interesting characteristic is that we differentiate capital vintages, and that allows us to better link the functioning of the model, the dynamics of the model, to also investments that are made in new technologies, which are then more efficient. And uh, we can try to link that to the greening of the economy and of different sectors. Uh, finally, the main focus of the model is to link uh, economy to the environment. And uh, we do that by um, including uh, certain environmental indicators. So those are uh, greenhouse gases, of course, but we've also added outdoor air pollutant emissions. Um, in recent years, we, we've focused quite a bit on the um, transition towards a circular economy for which we've added the use of material resources. And then just this year, we've uh, focused a lot on um, plastics. Um, and it's uh, uh, consequences on the environment. So we've added uh, plastics uh, to the model. For both materials used in plastics, what's interesting is that we've differentiated primary from secondary um, uh, materials and flows so that that allows us to better study the transition to a circular economy. OK, so how do we quantify the cost of inaction in this uh, framework? Uh, basically, we aim at understanding how changes in environmental quality, for instance, uh, pollution, uh, changes in the state of the global climate and the availability of natural resources affect the economy and therefore prospects for long-term economic growth. 
Uh, we do that by exploiting the details of the models as much as possible. So uh, linking the environmental damages to um, regions and sectors differently. Um, so the focus of the model, because it's an economic model, is on the market impact. That is uh, basically all impact that can be linked to the production function of the model, and that can be detailed enough to um, to link to different variables in the model. So we refer to that as a production function approach, but I'll get back to it in a minute. Um, what we do is that then economic feedbacks of uh, environmental effects are, um, are linked in our general equilibrium framework. And uh, we find that that's that the general equilibrium framework is a good way to be able to consider both direct and indirect um, effects. Um, what do I mean by that is that, for instance, when you um, when you have, uh, let's say, disruptions from climate change, let's say sea level rise, you're decreasing the amount of land available on the coast, for instance. And that is a direct effect. But then as indirect effects, you also have that the countries that are most affected will lose in competitiveness compared to others. Um, so there are indirect effects through trade, but also adjustments in the uh, production and consumption bundles, for instance. So these effects can be distinguished in the computable general equilibrium model, and that's the advantage of choosing uh, such a framework. However, there are some effects that then are hard to take into account. And uh, for those, um, we try to still provide some insights in order to be able to um, provide a comprehensive picture. So that applies to non-market damages, such as those on mortality, which we then um, usually um, rely on evaluation on valuation approaches to quantify. Um, in terms of the modeling analysis, um, a CG model is not sufficient in itself to be able to take into account the cost of environmental inaction and environmental feedbacks to the economy. So we actually rely on different modeling tools, which we linked in a um, semi-integrated framework. I say semi-integrated because it's not um, um, basically, we're soft linking the models and we don't have a full, let's say, optimization loop like you would have in an integrated assessment model of the rice dice type. Um, so we start with our economic model, EMV linkages, which we use to create um, projections of economic activities by region and sector and uh, to calculate the corresponding environmental pressure, such as emissions, materials use, etc. As a next step, uh, we look into environmental models, which we use to link environmental pressure to indicators um, that uh, of the state of the environment. For instance, um, the MAGIC model is used to go from greenhouse gas emissions to temperature changes. Uh, likewise, we rely on models to calculate concentrations of pollutants. And for that, we basically need a biophysical model. We can't rely anymore on, a, uh, of an, on an economic model. As a next step, we uh, rely on impact models or at times information from um, uh, sectoral models or um, empirical uh, analysis. Um, but basically, the next step is to translate uh, the state of the environment, environmental indicators, into biophysical impacts. So, for instance, um, uh, temperature changes or changes in precipitation will affect crop yields. Uh, polluted concentrations will affect the incidences of pollution related illnesses. Um, the next step is then to, um, let's say, price the environmental impacts or translate them into uh, economic variables. Uh, changes to economic variables due to the environmental impact. So, for instance, uh, we're talking about changes in productivity, which, as I explained earlier, can be linked to um, the incidences of illnesses due to air pollution or uh, supply of production factors. Um, and then at the very last step, we basically feed these variables back into the model 
um, changing the levels of, for instance, production or productivity so that um, we see the effects on economic growth. Um, I'd like to take some time to explain a bit more in detail what uh, exactly we're doing the model in this last step and what we mean by a production function approach. So if we take a fairly standard production function uh, in which output depends from uh, labor inputs, capital inputs, and then intermediate goods, as well as resource inputs. Um, and um, these inputs are then um, also related to um, productivity parameters so that we have a total factor productivity parameter, but then also input specific productivity such as labor productivity and capital productivity, et cetera. Um, that is our starting point to look at the, um, at the environmental impact. And it's also um, a, a standard production function uh, a, a CG model would rely on. So we then use these parameters to, um, as thoroughly as possible, link the environmental impact to the production function. So as I said, for instance, um, air pollution can be linked to the uh, to labor productivity. Uh, climate impacts can be linked to uh, capital supply. For instance, when we look at uh, disruptions from uh, climate extreme events from climate change, uh, but also sea level rise, which will modify um, uh, the supply of capital, but also supply of land. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So we um, basically look at the key endpoints, the key endpoints of um, that climate change or other environmental issues have that would affect this production function. Um, given that uh, uh, background on our modeling approach, I'd like to now move on to show you some key results from the reports we've published on the topic. Um, as I think that help to better understand um, what type of work we do and what uh, could potentially be done um, at the bank as well. Um, and I'll start with uh, climate change. Uh, so here we're talking about the uh, consequences of inaction on climate change. Um, the impact from climate change that we include in the model, um, as I said, relying on the production function approach are um, looking at agriculture. So in, in this instance, we have agriculture yield changes uh, for different crops, but also looking at uh, fisheries as that's also modified um, due to climate change. We then look at coastal zones uh, for which we have capital and land losses due to sea level rise. Uh, we look at climate related health issues and that includes both climate related diseases and how they increasingly spread around the globe but also labor productivity losses from heat stress we look at energy demand as climate change affects uh, the demand for energy for both cooling and heating depending on uh, which global region we're focusing on um, we then look at demand for tourism as uh, tourism patterns are also affected by climate change. And then finally, we take into account capital damages from uh, hurricanes, uh, from climate related hurricanes. Um, as I said, what we can't put in the production function, we then look at in, um, in uh, separate modeling um, efforts uh, to be able to provide a larger picture. Uh, so what we can't um, quantify are the, uh, sorry, what we can't put into the model are premature deaths from heat waves, um, urban damages from river floods, and then uh, changes to ecosystems um, and biodiversity uh, changes. Uh, what we actually can't quantify at all uh, are large scale disruptive uh, events. So here we're talking also, for instance, um, about uh, climate tipping points and international migrations. Um, so uh, basically, as I said, what we look at is that the um, consequences for long term economic growth. So what you will see in this slide is the regional cost 
from the climate impacts we've selected. Um, and that's presented in terms of deviations in the uh, gross domestic product, uh, either global or regional, as a percentage of a counterfactual baseline in which there are no climate damages. So at the global level, um, when we look at climate damages, that basically implies a loss of around 2% of global GDP at a 2060 time horizon. And here I'd like to highlight that, as I said, we're not taking into account all climate impacts. So it's likely being uh, the impact on GDP is likely underestimated, especially when we can't take into account um, uh, tipping points. Um, although the likelihood of tipping points happening at 2060 is fairly limited. Um, so if the global um, number um, is rather limited, although a 2% loss in global GDP is, um, is not negligible, uh, there are large differences across regions. So for some regions, the uh, overall impact on climate change would be quite limited. So for instance, OECD uh, European region, OECD Pacific, which includes um, Japan, Korea, but also Australia and New Zealand, and OECD America, all would have fairly limited um, impacts. Um, again, here I'd like to point out that the OECD Europe region includes regions that are very different, and therefore it's quite uh, normal that the uh, aggregate um, impact is limited. But if we look at the region, there's likely going to be large differences between northern European countries and Mediterranean countries, and they kind of offset each other as some Scandinavian countries, for instance, might end up having um, um, economic benefits from climate uh, damages. Um, the picture is very different when we look at non-OECD countries. Uh, for which climate damages can actually go um, uh, imply high GDP losses, especially when we look at um, South and Southeast Asia and African countries, including uh, Middle East and North Africa, but also Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> the other thing we uh, need to take into account when uh, calculating climate damages is uncertainty. And one of the key sources of uncertainty is the climate uh, sensitivity, meaning that, um, sorry, that reflects the link between um, changes in temperatures and changes in the state of uh, uh, the climate. So how responsive is the climate to changes in temperatures? Um, when we take in that into account, we have that uh, the uncertainty ranges show that the damages can be actually much higher than just looking at the central um, levels of climate sensitivity. And so for some regions, the um, GDP losses could go to up to 7% of GDP to 2060. And when you take into account that these are also regions that are still developing, um, it, it highlights the need to look at to try and limit climate damages because um, it could seriously pose problems to the development of the economic development of these regions. It's also interesting to look at the <clears throat> contribution of different um, impacts, um, like from different sectors and different climate damages. In the shorter term, the um, the largest amount of damages come from um, health. Um, as I said, this includes both illnesses and um, uh, from damages from heat waves. Um, that's because of the linkage to um, labor productivity. And, uh, uh, and that's quite uh, interesting and key. Uh, the other uh, one is from uh, agriculture, um, as of course agriculture is a, a key sector. Uh, and also highly affecting um, the, the global economy because of uh, it's a highly traded uh, good. Uh, when we look at how this changes to 2060, first of all, the damages increase over time, but also uh, the agricultural damages become relatively more important um, as uh, and, and that's due to both an economic effect of the uh, of the key role of agriculture, but also because the damages increase over time. 
Um, I understand that uh, the main focus of um, uh, your work is uh, currently on um, climate change, but I'd like to highlight a little bit our work on um, the uh, on air pollution. Um, the reason for it is that um, the co-benefits from air pollution when looking at climate change are also very significant. So when you take into account the damages from air pollution, uh, it's, uh, it, it's actually very helpful in trying to argue for uh, greening the economy and uh, uh, scaling up policy action on climate change. So I think just the next few slides will explain um, a little bit more on um, why it's relevant and what the damages from air pollution are in the economy. Um, again, what we include in the CG model is um, the effects of air pollution on morbidity. So in the cases of illnesses and these affect um, the number of cases of bronchitis in children, but also cases of chronic bronchitis in adults and hospital admissions. Um, this also includes, um, so, sorry, this results into increases in health expenditures. Um, again, related to health and illnesses, there is an increasing number of work days lost, which affect labor productivity. And then finally, um, crop yields are also uh, affected by air pollution levels. Uh, what, we, uh, what we quantify separately is the cost of premature deaths and the cost of pain and suffering from illness. And what we can't quantify is the number of other um, effects that air pollution has on the environment that can also affect the economy. So effects on biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, but also um, the effect it has on buildings and cultural heritage, which can be quite expensive to clean up. But we couldn't quantify these effects at the global level. Um, so when we look at the projections of the concentrations of air pollutants uh, at the global level, it's actually quite clear that the main issues are in the um, Asian countries. So this is the uh, a picture in 2010. When you project to 2030, you can see air pollution increasing, and even more so when you look at the 2060 time horizon. Um, what does that mean for uh, GDP changes? Uh, we have that there is a loss due to the additional health expenditures, uh, due to labor productivity, and a more limited loss due to agricultural impacts. And overall, uh, the effects on GDP are lower than climate change, uh, but still equivalent to around 1% of uh, GDP. Once again, uh, there are differences across uh, regions. Uh, with um, regions most affected uh, from health expenditures and labor productivity being mostly in um, Asian uh, regions, but also uh, Russia and other former Soviet Union countries, so Eastern European countries. Um, the effects from agricultural damages are more limited. Um, now, uh, just to highlight um, the advantages of working on a CG model, you'll see that uh, in some countries, such as uh, Brazil and other Latin American regions, but also Russia, uh, there is an interesting positive effect in agriculture from, um, from air pollution damages. That is not to say that air pollution is beneficial to crops in these regions, but it's a, uh, an effect from um, from the general equilibrium model. So what happens here is that um, as um, agricultural goods becomes relatively more expensive when you take into account the damages um, and there is less supply in some regions, uh, these regions end up producing more as they can better adjust um, thanks to more availability of land, for instance. So they gain in competitiveness and they end up having a positive economic effect from the damages. And it doesn't mean that there is a positive environmental effect though. Um, the main advantage, however, sorry, the main benefit from air pollution uh, policy action or climate policy action when looking at air pollution co-benefits would be on uh, the limiting the amount of premature deaths which were already high in 2010. There were around 3 million people at the global level, but they're projected to increase even more uh, to 2060, uh, 
basically tripling, doubling or tripling according to, um, you know, in the sensitivity analysis. Um, I'd like now to turn to highlight our work on the um, benefits of policy action, but we've also made an effort to try and take into account the cost of policy action, as very often uh, we forget that it's not uh, free of cost to reduce uh, emissions. Um, I mean that in a modeling uh, setup, uh, where models very often look at the benefits from policy action without modeling the costs. Um, so when we want to look at both costs and benefits of policy action uh, in a, a CG framework, what we do is that we take into account the reduction in the damages I've just outlined. So for instance, in the case of air pollution, we would have higher labor productivity, lower health expenditures with more freedom to spend in the preferred good, um, and higher agricultural productivity. That needs to be um, modeled together with, for instance, the investments in best available technologies that are needed to reduce air pollution. Um, so what, uh, what do we do when we look at uh, modeling the cost um, of policy action? Uh, we take into account the direct effects from sectoral investments that are needed to improve production technologies. Um, which then allows us to also take into account indirect effects in terms of uh, the adjustments uh, between sectors, international trade, but also competitiveness. And most importantly, to take into account the economic boost, boost that um, derives from the additional investment um, that are put in place to reduce air pollution. Uh, what we find overall is that uh, policy costs are limited and, compens and compensate bene compensated by the benefits from policy action, highlighting that undertaking policy action wouldn't be, um, would overall lead to positive effects also on the economy. Um, I'd like to just show you some results because I think they highlight the mechanisms within the model, which are quite interesting. Um, this is a study that zoomed on to the Northeast Asia region as it has um, a lot of air pollution and interesting dynamics between uh, countries. In particular, we focus on three countries, Japan, Korea and China, Japan and Korea being OECD countries um, and hence generally more regulated on air pollution and uh, China being a, a non-OECD country, which has made a lot of efforts on air pollution, but not being quite up to standards yet. Um, there are also interesting dynamics in the region due to transboundary air pollution, uh, so that policy action in China makes a big difference also on air quality in Japan and Korea. So we take into account different scenarios, some country-specific scenarios, so only Japan and only Korea or Japan and Korea taking policy action, and then China alone, and then the three countries together. That allows us to also take into account uh, competitiveness effects, and to fully understand those, we also have a global policy action scenario. So uh, when we look at air quality in the region, uh, we can see that from uh, the current state of things uh, to um, uh, sorry, to the future, that there, there needs to be some improvement and that uh, with um, current policies, there, there is already some improvement to uh, 2050. Uh, but that air pollution uh, really needs additional policy action so that air quality highly improves only when uh, three countries undertake policy action. In economic terms, what we find is that um, there is uh, a, the costs and benefits more or less balance each other out. Uh, so in this slide, you see the benefits in uh, uh, gray and the costs in uh, blue. Um, the um, benefits increase over time, especially for, uh, sorry, increase as policy action expands to uh, uh, to go from the single country policy action to regional policy action and then to global policy action, which highlights the fact that these countries suffer from transboundary air pollution. Um, for China, the case is uh, different as benefits and costs balance each other are in any case, uh, highlighting the fact that uh, China's air pollution 
is in itself the main driver of um, of the uh, damages in uh, in the country itself. Um, we can also try to uh, look more specifically where the costs and benefits come from. So if we look at the benefits, we see that the main driver is changes in uh, labor productivity, um, which as I highlighted already is, uh, is really one of the closest linkages to economic uh, growth. Uh, when we look instead at the costs, uh, the fact that we have a general equilibrium framework allows us to distinguish, as I said, between uh, direct and indirect uh, uh, costs. And in this instance, we break down the uh, indirect costs into a domestic effect and international effect, um, exploiting the different scenarios, um, as I explained, uh, and specifically the global policy action scenario. So um, looking at this slide, what's interesting is that there is a different behavior again between uh, Japan and Korea on one hand and then China on the other hand. Um, so in all cases, there is an initial direct cost that's imposed uh, for the three countries. And then when we look at the indirect cost, we see that there is um, an, a positive domestic, uh, indirect domestic effect. Uh, in all three countries, meaning that there is, uh, to a certain extent, an economic boost that comes from the investments uh, that are made to reduce air pollution. Uh, but then there is also an international effect. This effect is positive in uh, Japan and Korea, um, as the countries uh, are initially disadvantaged uh, uh, due to the additional costs imposed to the economy. But uh, the, uh, they gain again in their, let's say, competitiveness position as policy action is implemented globally. For China, interestingly, the international effect with the global policies is negative. That is due to the fact that uh, with um, policies being imposed at the global level, that actually <clears throat> causes less demand for, uh, produce, for goods produced in China. Um, so that there is an additional cost to the um, indirect cost to the Chinese economy. Uh, maybe to highlight that the level of policy action we take into account here on air pollution is really quite high, which is why there is um, there is a difference uh, also in the uh, Chinese economy when you take into account global policy action. Um, I'd like to end with um, explaining. Uh, while well, providing an overview of other types of modeling tools that could be used to analyze climate change and highlighting what, let's say, the pros and cons are for the different types of tools. My take is that um, there isn't a right or wrong. It's just that different models help answering different types of questions. At times, actually, as I showed higher up in the presentation, you need different modeling tools to answer one single question. Um, so historically, let's say that the main workforce for climate um, economy analysis have been integrated assessment models. The advantages of these models is, is that they um, have a full loop, which allows uh, better understanding the interactions between the biophysical and the economic systems. Um, there also the best tool when you want to look at um, optimization of policy action. So there is a lot of work that's been done recently, again, in updating the social cost of carbon estimates um, in different countries. Uh, there are generally global models that allow to have a global picture and in the very long term, so up to the end of the century. And that's good because uh, it really allows to take into account the long term um, characteristics of climate change and work backwards to understand what policy action needs to be done nowadays um, in order to uh, to achieve certain uh, climate targets. Um, the advantage of CG models, as I said, is that they can into, take into account the indirect effects. And again, here we're talking about a type of model that's global and that looks at the long term structural changes. So Basically, the question they try to address is how what do we have to change to go from the current situation to uh, 50 years from now where we want to have a green economy? What structural changes would take place and how do we uh, reach those? 
um, DSG models are another important tool and they look at an aspect that's generally quite different. So they generally focus more on the shorter term dynamics, focus on specific countries or regions rather than taking a global approach. Um, and they are, uh, I would say, the best type of model to look at shorter term transition costs and disruptions. Um, so what we lose here is like the global dimensions and the very long term dimension, but uh, they're a lot better at taking into account uh, shorter term um, issues and transition costs. Uh, recently, there's been quite a bit of effort in trying to incorporate climate change also in um, other type of models, such as agent based models. Um, the literature is still quite uh, young, but there are actually a couple of um, uh, instances of ABM models looking at climate change and specifically at um, the uh, at financial risks and the uh, response of uh, the financial sector to climate change damages. Um, the advantage of ABMs is that they better take into account interactions between different types of agents and uh, more importantly, the uh, role of individual choices and how that kind of can have a larger scale. Um, impact on uh, on the economy. Um, I'd like to highlight that to um, let's say explore what's uh, uh, out there in the recent literature on climate change. Uh, we've recently had um, uh, well the end of last year a two day workshop to discuss um, the current state of scientific understanding on modeling with specific focus on abrupt changes and um, economic resilience. Um, so we, we had an overview of different types of models focusing on uh, uncertainty and how to better take into account uh, climate resilience. Um, the focus being on how can new modeling approach then um, be developed to better address these issues. Um, I think that there is a specific part of the workshop that would be of your uh, interest because there is a recent literature that's been developed that focuses specifically on climate related socioeconomic tipping points. So maybe to step back, there is um, when we talk about tipping points, we talk about, for instance, the melting of uh, uh, Arctic ice, uh, which would affect um, uh, sea level rise, um, et cetera. Um, so it's abrupt changes in the climate system that um, cannot be changed. Once it takes place, uh, that's it. That's why it's called a tipping point. These have been out there in the literature for a long time. What's new is the concept of a climate related socioeconomic tipping point. So it's a translation of the same tipping point concept, but looking at the economy. So here we're looking at um, how a climate impact would get to the point that it would then heavily modify in an abrupt way the economic system. This could, for instance, be uh, from the agricultural sector, where at a certain point you have a crop that completely dies and then you have to um, live with viruses in the economic system, modifying uh, food production, etc. Or, uh, as you, you know, more um, uh, given the current situation, it could be from uh, energy supply. So you could have one specific country that finds itself without um, knowing how to uh, supply energy around the country. Uh, so it's an interesting literature uh, and closely linked to the concept of economic resilience. Uh, within this literature, I think more work needs to be done to explore the interactions in economic tipping points. For instance, um, what happens if in a specific country you um, you have a heavy uh, heavy uh, levels of climate damages as well as um, um, heavy costs due to the stringency of policy action uh, that can lead to uh, serious problems also in uh, government finances. Um, it's a literature that needs to try and bring together uh, macroeconomic and financial uh, analysis uh, through models that are able to better capture short term dynamics. Um, so I believe that your efforts are uh, would be able to contribute uh, in this direction. 
Um, and then finally, um, all economic models generally rely on empirical studies, and here there is effort to be made in better understanding the micro foundations of the relationship between, for instance, temperature and macroeconomic and financial impacts. Um, what would help here is more empirical analysis at the industry or firm level, but also going um, more uh, um, regionally, uh, so looking at subnational effects. Um, with that, I'd like to end that I'd be happy to um, answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Elisa, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, what really struck me in uh, in the presentation is the is the sheer complexity in modeling the various impacts of climate change, and it is very difficult, if not impossible, to find a one size fits all model. Uh, but rather, you need to rely on uh, on a suite. Uh, of models and focus on their complementarities. I will now open the, the floor for the Q&A session. Uh, as I said in the introduction, please use your raise your hand button and uh, also switch your camera and briefly introduce yourself. So given that right now we don't have any questions, let, let me let me start myself. Mine is a kind of a, a, a modeling, a modeling question. Like you mentioned a lot the, the CGE model and we are in the process of uh, developing uh, a CGE model in addition to our DSG model. Uh, so what features are needed in a, in a CGE model uh, that allows you to focus on environmental and uh, and climate policies. Uh, just to give like a little bit more context, like in a DSG model, if you want to focus on uh, environmental consideration, you definitely would need an energy block. Uh, you would need like different sectors, perhaps a brown and a green sector and perhaps also an external sector. So usually in a plain vanilla DSG model, you would not have these features. Is it the same with a, with a CGE model that in order to address climate change policies, you need certain features in the, in the model that you won't find them in a, in a plain vanilla CGE? It's uh, extremely similar indeed. So, um, so, a standard CG model would have less details on the energy sector, so you would have, for instance, an aggregate energy uh, sector or extraction, so extraction and energy supply. But uh, here it's quite key to be able to differentiate different types of uh, energy production. Uh, so what you generally do is, first of all, to break down the uh, social accounting matrix so that you have different types of fossil fuel related um, production. So we distinguish between gas, coal and oil. Um, and then uh, to uh, isolate the uh, amount of electricity that comes from renewable sources as well as other green sources, for instance, uh, nuclear. Um, the way this is done is generally to um, couple your CG model or at least try and find the right type of information from a bottom up energy model. So in our case, we rely on the uh, International Energy Agency's um, uh, modeling uh, tool which provides at the um, at the global level for different global regions uh, the um, the energy mix and the uh, quantities of energy um, likewise it's important to be able to identify uh, isolate key sectors uh, so uh, the sectors that are linked to the main uh, sources of emissions um, so, for instance, it would be the emission intensive sectors, industrial sectors um, uh, from the, the rest so that you can uh, as thoroughly as possible uh, model uh, greenhouse gas emissions as linking them to the different sectors. Um, so I think that's 
uh, that's quite key. And the challenge like for modeling in general is often on uh, data availability. Um, so I don't know if you're trying to build a CG model for Malta uh, or where Malta is isolated as a country or if you want to go into sub regions. But at times they yeah, are going into regional CG models that also exist is quite challenging because of the um, lack of data availability. Thank you, Elise. I think we have a question from Deputy Governor DeMarco. Uh, yes, he hello. Um, good morning and thank you very much, Elisa, for your very interesting presentation. If, if I understood you correctly, when you were um, uh, describing the model that, 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 that you built, um, you, you mentioned at one point um, that um, you did not um, uh, include an, um, migration or factor in migration effects. Um, do, 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 do you have any plans to include the effects of migration in response to impacts uh, from climate effects? Um, for example, um, fr from the indications that you gave um, uh, around, uh, around the impacts of, of climate change, you, you highlighted that, for example, um, one of the strongest impacts is on agriculture, and it seems that that the most uh, severely affected uh, countries or regions are are generally considered to be poorer regions. So, um, in this in this respect, I would expect, for example, a response of migration from poorer countries to more richer um, uh, regions, um, which are which are of course economically um, uh, stronger and also, according to your results, are less impacted from from climate effects. So, so I would expect, you know, um, quite sizable uh, migration effects, which in turn, of course, have impacts on 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 the hosting regions then as well. Yes. So um, maybe I'll take a step back to say that when we calibrate the economic baseline of the model, we do take into account uh, projected migration patterns which um, are uh, calculated I mean it's the UN projection and the UN takes into account different factors including um, to a certain extent uh, um, what they believe would be climate related migration so somehow it's taken into account um, okay. I also like to say that we have uh, we work on the social um, shared socioeconomic pathways. Um, so those are country specific pro economic projections. Uh, when you look at, at those, each uh, share, sorry, each SSP um, has a different um, migration pattern. So we work closely with um, the people producing the um, demographic projections to then adjust the baseline. Um, just you know, for information that's available. Um, what we did not do is to uh, take into account the uh, climate-related uh, migration when assessing the damages. The reason for it is because it's very hard to be able to identify what share of the migration pattern is attributable to climate change at the global level. For certain, um, let's say, migration flows, it's fairly clear because there is a trend in uh, climate-related uh, migration from desertifying areas, for instance, uh, the ones, as you said, are most affected by agriculture. But we did a global study, and at the global level, it's very hard to identify if there's any migration that comes, for instance, from uh, southern European countries towards northern European what it's very hard to say if that's climate related because people hate the summers getting hotter or if it's because of economic regions reasons so at least when we did the study it was a bit hard to uh, identify the effect i know that there are more recently a couple of studies that look specifically at climate related migration so it is um it's possible but it does need a few assumptions which we did not want to take, basically. Thank you. Have a we have a question from Aaron Grek, our chief economist. 
Hi, Riza. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, now, to give you some background, yes, at the bank we are developing a, a CG model um, with the idea that eventually this will help us to um, carry out the sort of analysis that uh, you, you have been describing in your presentation. Um, what, one aspect that uh, I'd like to uh, to discuss with you is um, uh, in these types of, of in a situation where um, a given amount of energy production happens to be imported. Um, what sort of um, what sort of modifications you would need to to your model? Would you need to have a sort of two sectors for energy, the domestically generated energy sector, and then uh, sort of uh, imported uh, energy sector that would have to be uh, modeled separately? Uh, or do you think that um, you could just have one sector there? Because of course the 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 types of productions will be very different. So, for example, our energy, our locally produced energy, is uh, uses LNG. Um, but when we import energy, it it's a mix. Uh, it could be coming from anything. Uh, it could be coming from nuclear. It could be coming from coal. Uh, it would depend on 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 the on the mixture there. How would you kind of uh, account for that? So uh, this is actually one of the advantages of using a computable general equilibrium model because besides the uh, production uh, flows, uh, which uh, you know identify the different sectors, everything is also like all economies are linked through international trade. So for instance, when you're looking at a specific country's energy mix, you'll have which amount of um, energy is produced in the country and then it's your own country's energy mix but there is also what percentage of energy comes from abroad and generally you you know where it comes from now the assumption is that then the um, energy uh, imported uh, follows the same shares let's say of uh, energy mix but actually um, very often you actually have the exact um, uh, trade flows. So, for instance, in the model, you can see the amounts of gas that used to be exported from Russia to different countries. So that you know that it's not following the simple energy mix in Russia, but it's it's those um, it follows that um, export uh, flows. The thing is, uh, whatever comes from abroad in terms of energy uh, constitutes an economic flow, and Therefore, as such, it directly enters the social accounting matrix of a CG model. So that's um, that's in a step that is actually before you get to try to break down um, the uh, the energy mix in volume terms. That's the additional steps that you need, the breaking down your energy production so that you can better uh, link economic flows to, like, let's say, megawatts of energy produced or uh, quantities of fossil fuels used, and then that's linked to the emissions that are uh, relative, for instance, to burning those amounts of fossil fuels. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the part you were talking about, I believe that's already in the economic flows of the model. So you can identify it in the CG model. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think it, it does. Elisa, we have a question in the, the chat by Andrea Tosato. Uh, he said, I am under the impression that economic damages from climate change estimated by the OECD models are rather limited. A GDP loss of between 1 to 3% by 2060 does not seem to justify the efforts and the costs required to transition to zero emissions by 2050. How do you square this tension? Uh, are there any non-linearities, for instance, tipping points that the OECD models are perhaps not taking into consideration? 
So this is a very good question, which would need another hour to answer, but I will try to be uh, as quick as possible. So first of all, as I said, the, uh, the, the global number is uh, limited, but uh, what really matters is the uh, regional differences as the global number um, also reflects some of the economic benefits that will come from climate change as some regions will actually have better precipitation patterns, better temperatures, uh, more crop yields, etc. So it, it's a balancing out of different things. It's extremely hard to take into account all the damages from climate change. Um, it becomes a bit easier when you go at more regional level because then you can uh, take into account more uh, more damages and more uh, of the aspects. Uh, one example is we worked quite a bit with Arctic Council countries. Um, so if at the global level, all you see is, for instance, uh, more crops, more land use, when you go locally, you can better um, see that these are not necessarily positive things, that they would change the habit and the economic structure in a way that people don't necessarily want. So uh, part of the issue is that we did a, a global study uh, when there were also less uh, quantitative information that there are uh, nowadays. Um, whereas uh, when you want to do a proper, let's say, cost benefit analysis, whether to do, to undertake policy action in your country, I think the um, you can also have uh, achieve more information and better model um, the effects. The other thing, however, since the second part of the question is, uh, are we not taking into account certain non-linearities, uh, is the time issue. Our study is to uh, 2060, but most tipping points would take place towards the end of the century at the earliest. Most tipping points are actually projected to be able to, um, sorry, to, to take place even later than that. Um, and nevertheless, uh, it's important, like the policy action we take now, it's important to avoid that there is a full breakdown of the global climate in like 100 years. So if you uh, wanted to, to, you know, properly, let's say, square this pension uh, and do a full assessment of the costs and the benefits at the global level, you uh, would have, first of all, I think, to change tool and get into an integrated assessment model. Uh, because it can go into longer term. But then you also wouldn't be looking at yearly losses in GDP. You would have to work backwards looking at the net present value of the uh, future changes. Um, that, um, that is done by some modeling efforts, including a recent update uh, by Nordhaus. Um, but uh, there is lots of assumptions that need to be taken as nobody really knows the economic effects of any of these climate tipping points. We don't really know much about them from the uh, biophysical viewpoint, let alone the economic viewpoint. So indeed, we haven't taken them into account, but um, it is very hard to do so. And again, it would require a different framework um, with the calculation of net present values. Um, because the, everything will take place very far in the future with choices that need to be taken right now. We've already had like more than 15 minutes of Q&A, but I think there is one final question. So I'll allow it by Dr. Mari Brigoglio from the University of Mota. Try to be brief, Mari. Mari, I think you're muted. I think there there's some there's some problem with uh, with Dr. Brigolio. Uh, so okay, this, this brings us to to the end of of this session. Uh, thanks a lot, Elisa, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, it was an eye-opening experience. Also, for the uh, for your focus on the on the modeling uh, 
uh, aspects of modeling climate change. So let me now turn to the to the next presentation. Uh, in this presentation, two of our economists from the research department will be presenting our most recent modeling work uh, in the area of energy and environmental policies. Uh, for those who were with us last year, uh, you recall that we also had a presentation on a CGE model that we were and still are in the process of developing uh, in collaboration with the University of Macerata. But today our focus we want to discuss the latest plans and efforts in this area, but using a different modeling techniques. So today the discussion will focus on DSG models. We will have two speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Noel Rapa, who is the manager of the modeling office in the research department. Uh, Noel holds an MSc in economics from the University of Warwick. Uh, Noel has played a key role in the development of METSI, which is our own DSG model for a small and open economy integrated in a monetary union. The second speaker will be Massimo Giovannini, a senior economist who works in the Economic Research Office. He holds a PhD in economics from Boston College. Uh, Massimo joined us earlier this year from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, and he is an expert in the development, use and estimation of DSG models, having worked on these models for several years. Uh, so now, Noel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for joining for joining us for uh, this workshop. In the next 30 minutes or so, myself and Massimo will try to give you an overview of the main modeling uh, activities that have been uh, ongoing at the economics division, focusing mainly on uh, modeling energy and climate change within our uh, existing toolkit. Let's start with the outline of the presentation. First, I will try to motivate um, why is it important for us to include energy and climate within our toolkit? And we are, I, I'm also trying to motivate why we use a DSG to, to do this. Then I go through uh, the main features of the Met, of METSI Energy, which is the new energy uh, module within our DSG framework. Then Massimo will talk about a new Euro area rest of the world model with energy and environmental externalities embedded within it. And finally, he will conclude by providing a, a modeling roadmap of where we're going with this project in the medium run. Let's move quickly to the first part of the presentation. Why is it important for a central bank to start to, to internalize energy and climate change within its toolkit? Uh, basically, everything started from most of the development started from the ECB strategy review, which was in, started in January 2020, where the ECB started reviewing most of its monetary policy aspects. And apart from reiterating its mandate towards price stability, uh, this review has identified in climate change, especially through the required transition uh, to a lower carbon economy as a development that could have profound price implications on price stability. In this light, the Governing Council has committed to a comprehensive incorporation of climate factors within its assessment. Now, from a modeling perspective, this creates the need of addressing these requirements by internalizing these features. And from um, some years onwards, central banks have started investing heavily on adapting their main policy tools with the relevant climate and energy related features, especially targeting the business cycle frequency. In parallel, during the same period, the central bank has also put forward a, uh, a, a comprehensive modeling plan that was aimed at identifying modeling gaps that we either currently have with the rest of the ESCB or else that we are going to face in the near future, especially in the light of the ECB strategy review. Amongst the main gaps that we have identified, there are obviously climate change and global spillovers which are at the heart of our modeling um, efforts right now. The need for the treatment of energy and climate within our models was further reiterated following the start of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, which has revealed the dependence of the EU economy on the imports of energy-related commodities. 
renewing the interest of policymakers in in effects and studying the effects of supply side energy shocks. In this light, we decided to develop a new modeling tool which is able to capture the Maltese economy's dependence on imported energy and energy commodities. To do this, we proceed through a parallel uh, process. Basically, we first augment METSI, the bank's DSG model, with a detailed energy block. Nonetheless, a holistic treatment of, a holistic treatment of climate uh, and energy shocks require a global dimension. Re I mean, this is quite obvious given the fact that climate and energy are global phenomena. It was decided, therefore, not only to augment METSI with the energy block, but also to develop uh, a two-country model, a new two-country model for the euro area and the rest of the world with an energy and environmental externalities. Now, apart from being an interesting research avenue as a standalone model, this euro area model is being developed with the main intention of integrating it with METSI, thus helping us close these two important uh, modeling gaps, climate change and global spillovers, thus allowing this model to study, to, to, to give us answers about how foreign climate or energy related shocks transmit to the domestic economy, while at the same time allowing us to study how uh, domestic government, for instance, policies can help us accelerate the transition towards a cleaner economy. Before delving into the model details, let me first spend a minute to motivate the choice of a DSG framework. We have, we have seen in the previous presentation by Elisa that there is a huge um, spectrum of models to be used. Uh, why do we go for the DSG? First of all, what is a DSG? What is a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model? These are micro-founded models where the model behavior is derived from solutions of intertemporal constraint optimization problems. Agents are modeled as forward-looking, implying that today's decisions are, taking while, uh, are taken whilst considering their implications on uh, future behavior. Moreover, unexpected or stochastic shocks are the main source of fluctuation in, in economic variables. These shocks together with parameters uh, which determine the behavior of the economy are have a structural interpretation and this implies that they are um, that they are indifferent to policy changes. They don't change when faced with a policy change, making these models robust to the so-called Lucas critique and making them the, the go-to models for policy institutions. Finally, these models can be taken to the data and they can uh, we can estimate parameters and shocks, making these models at least as empirically plausible as other non-structural models. Now, after due consideration of all the modeling options available, mainly whether to go down the route of a sectoral model like the one um, which Lisa showed before, or else a macro dynamic model, we choose to integrate uh, the, the energy or climate modules within our DSG models. Another viable option would have gone, what would have been by augmenting the computable general equilibrium model the sectoral model, which we are currently developing right now through a cooperation agreement with the University of Macerata in Italy. The DSG is seen to complement SEGE, mainly because DSGs provide information on dynamics, whereas CGEs are static in nature, even though you can include some dynamics in them. But DSGs have less sectoral information, whereas CGEs are more granular. The second reason why we go for a DSG at this point in time is that the basic CG is still under development and in order for it to say anything about emissions or energy related issues, the model would still have to be further extended. On the other hand, the bank already has a well functioning uh, DSG model, which could be augmented with the necessary modules at, the, at, at this point in time. Let's now move to the main features of the new um, energy block within METSI. The strategy we employ here, as I, as I said, was to start from a calibrated, an existing calibrated version of the bank's fiscal DSG model called METSI. We then choose to augment the model with a disaggregated and fairly uh, detailed energy sector. As Elisa has talked about before, there, there are 
a number of ways in which you can integrate climate or energy modules within your toolkit. The reason why we here focus exclusively on energy uh, is twofold. Firstly, around 75% of greenhouse gas emissions in Malta are attributable to the production of energy. And secondly, a detailed energy sector would allow us to correctly capture the pass-through of energy-related shocks to the rest of the economy, something which would be extremely helpful at this point in time. How do we do this? Basically, we split the intermediate production of the model in two phases. Now, uh, unlike most DSG models, production will not only be done through labor and capital, but we include uh, a role for energy. Not all energy is the same, however, so energy is modeled as a composite good. And in this case, we differentiate between fuel, electrical energy, and we further differentiate between brown and green electrical energy. Finally, we also allow a role for the interconnector, something which is important given that around 25% of all electrical energy consumption in Malta is supplied through the interconnector between Italy and Malta. Let's now move to, um, a, to have a bird's eye view of the production side of our model of METSI. First, starting from the production side of METSI without energy. This is how the production side looks like at the current moment without um, energy having a role in the production whatsoever. Basically, the, mo the most important thing that you have to understand is that capital and labor are the only two factors of production which uh, with which we produce tradable and non-tradable intermediate uh, outputs which when combined with imports gives rise to the final demand components that we all know about exports private consumption public consumption and investment now this is how the model with energy Sorry, this is how the, en the model with energy looks like. Uh, it looks a bit convoluted, but bear with me in a minute. I will surely make sure that we understand what's going on here. The most important thing to understand is that tradable and non-tradable inputs, sorry, tradable and non-tradable intermediate output is not only a function of capital and labor. Instead, capital and labor give rise to, uh, capital and labor give rise to tradable and non-tradable value added, which only when integrated with energy, they can give rise to uh, tradable and non-tradable intermediate outputs. As I told you before, not all energy is the same in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, etc. So basically, energy is modeled as a composite good. As a first layer of um, as a first layer, we disaggregate energy into fuel and electrical energy. Now Electrical energy is quite straightforward to understand. Electrical energy is simply the energy that you use every time that you plug in uh, to, to, to something on, on the grid. No, every time you switch on your lights, every time you switch on your electric, um, uh, your electric appliances or something like that. With fuel, you have to think of about uh, economic agents burning, combusting uh, fossil fuels themselves to create energy, to create heat, or motion energies or kinetic energy. Basically, it's every time that you turn on your gas hob at home to create heat, or every time that you turn on your petrol diesel car to create to, to, to move your car to create motion. We differentiate between fuel and electrical energy because elect for each megawatt hour of energy produced, electrical energy is somewhat cleaner than burning the same amount of energy yourself using fossil fuels. Still, electrical energy is not all the same. And first, we disaggregate an electrical energy into renewable and grid electricity. So basically, economic agents have the chance to invest, invest in green capital, which when coupled with the technology available at that time, produces renewable energy. On the, other side, on the other hand, economic agents can buy electricity directly from our provider. And our provider, again, has a choice. So grid electricity is, it is produced as a combination of imported electricity, imported from the interconnector, or else uh, locally produced. And this local production is made by burning gas, which is imported and thus emitting 
greenhouse gas emissions, which together with our available technology or power plants produces local electricity. Now, every time that I say that, for instance, energy is a combination of fuel and electrical energy, these nodes here, these are modeled through a um, constant elasticity of substitution production function. Now, in layman terms, in, in, in usual words, so to say, we can say that the demand for each type of energy, therefore, in this case, fuel and electrical energy, depends, amongst other things, on relative prices, on the relative price of fossil fuels vis-a-vis -vis electrical energy, for instance. Now, this is important because it allows us to um, easily introduce uh, the government's role here, because the government can, through subsidies and taxes, change the relative prices and therefore distort the preferences of agents towards clean and energy if need be. Abstracting from all other fiscal uh, instruments available within the model and focusing only on the new ones, this block introduces three new um, fiscal instruments. First, the subsidy on green capital, which increases the rate of return on green capital, thus reducing the relative prices of renewable electricity. Secondly, a tax on grid energy, which distorts, which can distort the relative prices between grid electricity and renewable electricity. And finally, a fuel tax, which are the levies and VAT that we pay when uh, we buy uh, petrol and diesel from, from the pump. Now, what can this model be used for? As I already alluded to when talking about the fiscal instruments, this model can be used to simulate domestic government policies aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions by, by uh, either subsidizing clean energy or else taxing fossil or brown energy. Given the detail of the rest of the fiscal block, this model can also be used to explore the effects of the different financing options of these policies. Say that the government increases subsidies on green capital, which reduces the relative price of renewable energy, then what would be the best way to finance such subsidies? Should we tax conventional capital? Should we tax labor income? Or should we perhaps tax brown energy or reduce government expenditure? All these type of experiments can be done using uh, this model. Moreover, the current version of the model that is being tested also includes two ad hoc items, apart from the tax subsidy system that I talked about uh, just now, that capture the potential subsidization of energy and prices should the government wish, as he's doing right now, to uh, fully absorb or partially absorb foreign commodity shocks that emanate from uh, global supply of uh, energy commodities. Again, when coupled with the fiscal instruments at, uh, that, that are within the model, that are available, available within the model, we can also experiment with which is the best way to finance these, whether we should go for a debt financing, whether we should uh, reduce government expenditure somewhere else. These kind of uh, decisions have very tangible implications on the effectiveness or otherwise of the policy at, uh, of the policy that we are studying. Finally, the model can be used to uh, study the effects of commodity price changes, but this would be much better when the model is merged with the euro area rest of the world model that Massimo will talk about uh, in, in a short period of time. And also we can model changes in foreign energy mix through the introduction of the interconnector that we saw before. What can this model, what will this model not be able to do? Basically, this is not, in the strict sense of the word, a climate model. So we are not uh, modeling the physical impact of climate change. So we have no physical uh, focus on what on how greenhouse gas emissions translate into higher temperature and how that temperature will, in a way or another, disrupt production. But I am simply focusing on energy for the time being. Secondly, energy emissions are the only environmental side effect of economic growth, but there are much other things that go along with economic activity. Basically, I'm not looking at costs related to particulate matters, which might not necessarily uh, create climate change or, or, or exacerbate climate change, but might have health issues. Those for the time being are um, being abstracted completely. 
Finally, despite the, the granularity of the energy block, the model is still macro in nature. And sectoral disaggregation is key in order to fully understand what are uh, the implications of energy policies. And in this case, um, I, I wish to again mention the CGE model, which we are currently uh, developing. And in this case, the CGE, despite lacking uh, an easy way in which to include dynamics, would help us understand and model in a more explicit way the intersectoral dependencies that, uh, that exist within the economy. Um, that was all from my end. Now I leave the, the floor to Massimo, who will talk about the main features of the new uh, two country model that he's developing. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Noel, for uh, and Elisa for the previous presentation, which were uh, uh, really, really interesting. So now I will uh, try to um, guide you through uh, the second uh, modeling effort here at the uh, Central Bank of Malta, uh, trying to understand better issues related to energy and uh, the environment. I think that those are the two big elephants that we uh, need to deal with, and uh, we need the models uh, that allow us to understand better what's going on in our economies. OK, sorry. Um, so here we are talking about, so I would like to guide you through the intellectual process. Sorry, but, but why is not changing the slides? Okay, 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 sorry. So, um, so I would like to, uh, to guide you through the intellectual process that I went through when I when we decided to have a, a DSG model that uh, needed to deal with uh, energy and uh, environmental issues. So here in the next couple of slides on the left, on the left side, on the left column, you I will uh, try to streamline the basic the desired features that we wanted to add in our model. And on the right column, instead, you will see what are the modeling choices that we made in order to uh, deal with the desired features. So uh, in the last uh, few months, we clearly have seen that the Euro era uh, strongly and heavily uh, depends on imports on fossil fuels, and this has been already touched upon by both Elisa and Noel. And so we wanted to have a model that could say something about, about this. And so for doing that, we need a two country model, uh, with, in which there is the euro area on one end and the rest of the world. And we assume that the rest of the world is the only producers of fossil fuels. So this creates basically the modeling choice that uh, deals with the external dependence on fossil fuels. On the other end, and moving from energy towards more like environmental uh, issues, we wanted to say something about renewable sources. And that's why we assume uh, that our domestic energy sector combines domestically produced renewables with imported fossil fuels. So basically, our in the euro area, the, our energy mix, our energy bundle, will be a mix of two sources, uh, green uh, sources produced domestically and uh, fossil fuels, which are uh, polluting and uh, causing emissions uh, imported from the rest of the world. Then another point that another desired feature that we wanted, and also Elisa uh, talked about this in her presentation, is the issue of sectoral reallocation. So if there is a transition, if we, if we envisage and we want to do policy that allows us to try to go from a more brown intensive uh, production towards a greener intensive one, we need to have two sectors. We need to have two production sectors. One is uh, green, uh, which is we assume to be energy efficient and not polluting. And the other sector is a brown sector, which is a traditional sector, which is more capital intensive and less energy efficient. And so we want to have a model that allows us to uh, study the transition from uh, more brown intensive production to a, a greener one. Then there is a fourth desired features, uh, desired feature, which deals with uh, probably the biggest market failure that uh, uh, humans have been experiencing in the last hundreds of years, which is uh, uh, the uh, climate change externalities. So the externalities come from greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we need to do something to evaluate. Also, we need a model that allows to have a, a damage function, uh, which is similar in the same the spirit to what Elisa also explained in her CG uh, approach, that basically 
um, captures the fact that there is a relationship between uh, brown production, greenhouse gas emission, increase in temperature, and the feedback into the economy through natural disasters or lower productivity. Finally, since we are working with the DSG model, we try to uh, have a model that uh, uh, basically puts the, our model, our DSG framework at this, in this best position, which is to do some policy evaluation. And to do so, we uh, envisage a model in which the government, beyond the traditional tools on tax on labor, subsidies, uh, government spending, and so on and so forth, has a particular and uh, um, a array of policy instruments to cope with the, the market failures of the previous point caused by uh, climate change externalities and external energy dependence. So basically, we augment the traditional tools of the governments with excise duties on fossil fuels, subsidies to renewable production, carbon tax or cap and trade schemes to minimize or to reduce uh, emissions. Um, this is a sort of a helicopter view of the model of the two country uh, environmental DSG model that we are developing, uh, looking uh, in particular to the supply side. So in order to read the model, uh, to read the, the graph, I would invite you to go from uh, the bottom to, uh, to the top. So here you see that everything but this little uh, uh, rectangle, uh, which is the rest of the world, everything else is the euro area. So starting from the bottom right, we have we see that the rest of the world exports fossil fuels to the uh, to the euro area and basically here there is a yellow box which is the energy sector of the euro area in which a final energy bundle is a mixture of fossil fuels imported from the rest of the world and renewable energy that is produced through uh, domestic labor and capital uh, plus technology of course and here basically the energy bundle uh, the mix between renewable energy and fossil fuels can be determined also by the government, which could subsidize to some extent the production of renewable energy and uh, penalize the import and the use of fossil fuels through excise duties. So here there is a first attempt, there is a first role for the government to try to uh, move uh, the overall domestic economy towards a greener, a greener path. Then this energy bundle, which uh, is going to be uh, uh, a factor of production toward, uh, together with labor and capital to the two sectors of our, our economy, the green sector on the right and the brown sector on the left. So the main difference between these two sectors is that while whatever is produced with energy, labor and capital in the, in the green sector goes directly to, the, to increase domestic output, on the other hand, the brown sector uh, when puts together energy bundle, uh, the energy bundle, labor and capital, not only uh, produce out output, but also produce emissions. And emissions cause damages that erode output. And then uh, here there is a second place for the government to step in, which is by imposing carbon tax on uh, greenhouse gas emissions or cap and trade, sch uh, cap and trade uh, schemes on emissions. Uh, is a second role together with the previous role in mixing and try to gauging uh, towards a greener, a greener energy bundle, uh, another role for the government, as I said, to, uh, to, to um, direct and to try to, to deal with the, the, uh, the damages and the, the, uh, all the problems caused by um, emissions and the climate change. Then finally, uh, the domestic output after the erosion of, and the, uh, the erosion of part of this output to, to deal with the damages caused by emissions produces a final good, which is basically domestic output plus imports from the rest of the world, because we all know that our goods, whatever we consume, uh, is basically a mixture of uh, domestically produced goods and imports. And then part of this final good is going to be exported and uh, we will go to the rest of the world. So basically the rest of the world and the euro area uh, will, uh, will, um, uh, will interact uh, in a general equilibrium so that uh, prices exchange rate will all determine in, uh, in general equilibrium. Um, here I will list a few uh, extensions to this current setup. Um, so one type of extension, one set of extension is the multi-country dimension. Also, Lisa said that uh, one of the advantages of using CGEs is to have a sort of a global flavor with the multi-country settings. So we, we can also in DSG models, probably with a, a lesser extent, try to be a little bit more granular and to try to have a, a multi-country setting. Multi -country setting. Uh, so the first dimension is, as uh, we said with Noel, um, 
to include the, uh, the Medzi energy uh, into, um, into the Euro era rest of the world uh, model. Um, the second possibility is to separate the US from the rest of the world in order to um, say study what different policies made at the Euro era and in the US uh, dealing with energy and uh, environment can uh, uh, say could lead to different dynamics on inflation, for instance, which is something that is very relevant in these days, which ultimately will uh, determine the responses of uh, the monetary authorities. Finally, another, uh, uh, the last country dimension that we could think of, uh, we could think of is to uh, separate Italy, which is connected through the interconnected to Malta from the Euro area, so that we have a model with Malta, um, Italy, the rest of the Euro area, and the rest of the world, so that we could really see endogenously how shocks that generate, say, the rest of the world, uh, propagate through the Euro area, through Italy, and ultimately to Malta. Um, another possible extension, which I think could be very promising, would be to include and to add to the present setting a financial sector uh, allowing for green bonds. And this, uh, basically, these green bonds could be, uh, basically, there is a banking sector that try to uh, create bonds that are probably uh, engineered in a way to facilitate investment in, a green, uh, in, in the green sector rather than in the brown sector. And this also could be uh, important for possible intervention of the ECB, uh, like uh, something that has been talked about uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the table of many researchers, uh, which is the green quantitative easing. Uh, another extension is to not only think of energy as just a, an input for production as it is in the current setup of the model, but also to think of energy as also a final consumption good. So as probably also Noel said, every time we uh, transport, uh, we use our car or we turn on our, uh, our uh, uh, air conditioning or our, our heating system, we are uh, consuming uh, energy. So that could be another possibility to make the model uh, more realistic. And finally, another possible, another possible, and I think that is something that we should do, is to use a, a setup of the DSG model and this micro foundation to uh, do optimal uh, climate policy uh, uh, evaluation and welfare analysis. Um, so that we could move from the positive analysis of, of asking, okay, what happens in the Euro area and what happens in Malta if there is a uh, shock uh, to energy prices, we could also say what would be optimal response, what would be optimal government response uh, to uh, the problems that are on the table. Uh, finally, uh, this is the research roadmap regarding these two projects. So the, these two models have been started to be set up uh, and to say, um, to be envisioned uh, last summer. Uh, what we have already done is that we did all the theoretical uh, derivations. We did all the code development using Dynar, which is probably the most uh, commonly used uh, software for uh, DSG models. We um, calibrated our model, uh, so we use parameters that are coherent with data averages that are observed in the, in the last 20, 25 years. What we are doing now is a validation of the stochastic simulations, and the next step will be to provide policy evaluation by summer 2023, and to do on one end uh, the merging of the Euro era rest of the world model with the, the METC energy, and the estimation of the Euro era rest of the world, uh, rest of the world model by winter 2023. Finally, uh, the Central Bank of Malta is going to host and co-organize the 2020 Dana conference, which has a, we will have a special focus on energy and environment that will be held in October 2023. There will be enough opportunity to talk with other scholars coming from other institutions about the problems that uh, we discussed today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Massimo and Noel, for these presentations. I will now open the floor to questions and uh, comments. I don't see any raised hand, so perhaps I might ask a question uh, myself. Uh, Massimo, you, when it comes to estimating uh, these models, like do you foresee any data difficulties uh, when it comes to estimate like a model, especially the part of the of the rest of the world? 
or, or, or you think you'll be like relying on calibration for now? No, okay, so for now, uh, we will, uh, in order to understand the properties of the model, we will uh, st stick with the, with the calibration. The, what I see as the most problematic is not only the rest of the world, which, okay, uh, um, some data are available. Uh, what uh, is the most challenging uh, part is the damages coming from uh, greenhouse gases. So if you want to have to take to the data the and quantify the externalities coming from emissions into the economy, uh, that is uh, um, that is what uh, say worries me the most. But in fact, during the presentation that um, uh, this I had uh, before, I was thinking uh, that uh, she could uh, or maybe we could try to collaborate and try to find an indicator using all the different measure of damages that she talked about so that we could have a sort of a synthetic um, a synthetic measure that could, we could fit in and try to see whether the shocks, the filtered shocks that we will get, because of course this damage function is not only deterministic, there is also a stochastic component so that I mean, the rare events can happen more frequently as time goes by. So we need to keep track of that. And uh, so I would think I would think that maybe uh, Elise and their work of, of, of her colleagues could it be helpful in order to try to give us some uh, indicators that could be used as data for the damage component. We have a question actually from Elisa. Yeah. Hello again. Um, I have a question that's unrelated to um, <laughs> the last remark, but since uh, maybe I can quickly answer to what you just suggested. Um, it is, um, in fact, possible to create uh, aggregate indicators, um, and it's something we're trying to do with the economics uh, department to better link um, their uh, economic projections to also take into account uh, climate damages, and we do that relying on the marginal abandonment cost curves, so it is uh, possible. Um, I had a question for Noel, though, I thought it was uh, really great that you're trying to um, also include uh, modeling of policy instruments uh, to see the how they get to um, reduce emissions. I was just wondering if you had plans to go beyond fiscal instruments and also take into account other types of relevant uh, regulations. Or if, if what you presented reflects the policy mix in Malta. Thank, thanks, thanks, Elisa, for for your question. At the moment, we don't envisage including other instruments other than the government. Um, the reason is that, as you said, they are most probably, at least for now, the the the, the instrument package that is being um, pushed forward in order to aid in the transition to a low carbon economy is, for the time being. Um, speared by the government. We don't envisage that that's going to change in the near, in the very near future. However, as Massimo said, um, issues relating to uh, green bonds would have uh, an, an implication, even be also because um, they relate in some manner to the monetary policy uh, of the ECB. And if that comes, if, if, if the green bonds start to be used, for instance, in QE programs, then we would have to include them in some way or another. So apart from the fiscal, to answer your question, apart from the fiscal, the only thing that I'm envisaging now is perhaps green bonds. But again, it's not something that we would think about focusing right now. We would rather try to do something with the development of the CGE, because for the time being, we are losing all the granularity of the different sectors, rather than um, uh, keep developing more and more and more uh, the current setup that we're envisaging at the current moment. If there are no more questions uh, so thank you Noel and Massimo for your presentations and now we can turn to the final presentation uh, so now we have Valentina Antonaroli uh, who is a senior economist in the economic analysis department 
She holds a PhD in economics from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. She is the bank's reference person for the Household Finance and Consumption Survey project and also the bank's representative on the ECB HFCS network. So, Valentina, the floor is yours. I think you're muted, Vale. Yes, yes, sorry. Okay. Um, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. And thank you, uh, everyone, for joining. So, as anticipated, I will be delivering this presentation from some key results from the fourth wave of the household finance and consumption survey. Um, uh, previous waves were carried out in 2010, 2013, and 2017. The underlying article in the research bulletin is a joint work we have prepared together with Alejandra Muscat and Warren De Guara, and the user disclaimer applies. So the presentation I will deliver will proceed as follows. As an introduction, I will start off by giving a brief overview of the methodology adopted for this WAVES questionnaire. Uh, the HFCS collects household information um, on a broad range of topics, and we will go through the composition of income and wealth and look into more detail at the balance sheet items, which are assets and liabilities holdings, making a distinction also between real and financial assets. Uh, then I will show the results from the ad hoc COVID module we've included in the 2020 survey, which consisted of three questions asking households whether there had been any changes to income and employment due to the pandemic. Lastly, I will conclude with some general considerations. Uh, briefly, let me just point out that there's a growing attention for the distributional effects of monetary policy on the income and wealth of uh, various households, and at the basis of such interest is the fact that we have now understood the dynamics of economic aggregates are determined not only by microeconomic variables, but also by household specific factors. And in this case, in this sense, the HFCS plays a key role in providing the usual, uh, useful and reliable microeconomic data on underlying this distribution effect. I mean. So turning on to the methodology, uh, the sampling frame is taken from the National Population Register kept by the National Statistics Office and uh, was last updated as 2018. Um, the sample takes into consideration all private households in Malta, but it excludes persons living in institutions like uh, homes for elderly, for example. Uh, the household is the main unit of collection, although we do collect also some data at individual level, for example, demographics or uh, variables on income. Field work was carried out by the NSO between November 2020 and February 2021, and the average duration of the interview was roughly 30 minutes. Uh, this wave was the first time we had to make a switch from the mode in the mode uh, interview. Usually the survey was conducted in person via copy and due to obvious reasons because of the pandemic, uh, we had to, uh, to switch to, um, to telephone interviews. Uh, the results presented are based on a sample of 1,018 households of which roughly 34 percent constitute the panel component and the overall response rate achieved was around 54 percent. Um, also, we distinguish between uh, the reference period for uh, social demographic income and consumption data. This was the 2020 calendar year as a whole, while for balance sheet items data was taken at the end of October 2020. Finally, I want to uh, um, underline about uh, the importance of the weights because all the results presented are uh, to be considered weighted and uh, this is to agree with population uh, estimates broken down by age, gender and region and are also calibrated to national totals. This uh, makes the results from the achieved sample representative of the target population. So that's a very important point. OK, let me start off uh, with annual uh, household gross income. So uh, let me give you first the definition of, um, of gross household income in the HSTS, which is defined as the sum of all pre-tax income and social contributions, labor, pension and so forth, and return from financial assets, regular social and private transfers, and any other income sources. Uh, it's important to notice that total house income is the sum then of income derived both from sources at 
uh, in, at personal level, sorry, like uh, employee income or self-employed income, and, uh, and of sources from income at household level, like income from rentals or financial investments, for example. So all individuals in the households who have a source of income will have to answer directly question on income. This is important because sometimes uh, we are asked about um, the actual definition used for income in the HFCS. Yeah. Now, um, to give some uh, some numbers, the annual household gross median income for Malta in 2020, so that's uh, around 29,000 euros, up from around 25,000 euros reported in the 2017 wave. Uh, this increase was uh, broad based across all income quintiles, but the most significant uh, increase occurred actually in the bottom 20 percentile of the distribution, which rose by almost 25% up to a median value of 9,500 euros. Instead, uh, if we look at household at the top of end of the distribution, uh, they have a median um, uh, calculated estimated median of over 70,000 euros, implying that then they hold on average more than two times the overall median value for the population and almost eight times that of households in the first quintile of the distribution. Let's have a look now at the sources of income, at the components. Employee income is the most important source of household income, um, making up over 70% of the total, while the share of self-employment income is around 9%. Uh, the chart on the right hand side instead shows median income values for the main uh, components of income. Uh, median income for, uh, for Malta in, in 2020 was estimated to be around 32,000 uh, euros, while self employed income stood at the value of median value of around 15,000. And finally, income from pensions uh, was estimated to be at around 10,000 euros. These are also the components that drove the increase in total household income. That's why I chose to depict just three uh, a selection of all the sources of income, because uh, those three categories are the ones that rose mostly uh, between the two waves, the, under, the last two waves. We now turn our focus to net wealth, which is defined as households' total assets, net of liabilities. I will then um, want to speak about assets and liabilities defining this as well. Um, the estimated household median net wealth increased uh, from 236,000 in 2017 to 275,000 in 2020. Uh, in this case, to shed light on the distribution of wealth, since we know that wealth is highly concentrated in the hands of few rich people, we decided to split the, quintile, the last quintile into two subgroups. So the 80 to 100, the last quintile, we split between 80, 90 and above 90 percent. While the median net wealth for the lowest quintile of the population so that roughly 13,000 euros, that of the wealthiest 10 percent of households stood above 1 million. So that means that households in the top 10 uh, percentile of the population hold almost twice the wealth of household just in the immediate next 80-90 percent bracket and more than four times the median value of net wealth for the entire population. Although median values of net wealth in 2020 have increased with respect to 2017 across the entire distribution of wealth, uh, we have noticed that this increase has been higher for the center quintiles, um, namely the second, third and fourth quintile. Uh, now we delve into uh, the components of wealth. We start off by total assets, uh, uh, which is the uh, contributor mostly to the evolution of net wealth. Uh, in the HFCS, we can distin distinguish sorry, between real and financial assets. Real assets include all valuables like houses, vehicles, jewelries, and also participation in non publicly uh, traded business. Financial assets, on the other hand, include all financial investments uh, like deposit holdings, savings, mutual funds, and listed shares. So, similarly, as to what observed to the previous waves, the composition of household assets in 2020 is mainly in the form of real assets in Malta, which make up almost 90% of the total assets. Uh, again, as observed in the last, uh, for the, all the past four, three waves as well, the real estate wealth is the most important asset in the portfolio of Maltese households, and it's been like this uh, since the first vintage of the HFCS. 
So again here, like for income, I didn't, we're not showing all the components of, of both categories of assets, but just uh, the, mo more import, um, the more important ones. On the left hand side, we have real assets, where the first uh, bar uh, HMR stands for household main residence, so it's the main property, and it's been uh, it's the most valuable asset has held by households. This is followed by um, uh, the value of other properties, so properties uh, from the second and onwards, and so uh, for for both. So the median value for the for the former, for the main property in 2020 was estimated to be 300,000 euros, while that the median for other properties stood at around 175,000 euros. We now switch to the right panel uh, where we show financial assets. And of this, the most uh, valuable uh, asset held are to be are found to be voluntary pension schemes and life insurances. Their estimated median value is around 36,000, uh, while that of deposit in 2020 was around a bit lower, just a bit under 14,000 euros. So here uh, we have uh, we want to show a population structure, so distribution for various asset holdings according to the distribution of wealth. Uh, again, I've selected some. Uh, we've selected some components, not showing all. The, would be visually not very nice. Uh, so with the exception of the main residence and deposits, uh, uh, all components of assets are found to be increasing in wealth. Uh, owning the primary residence results to be fairly equally distributed in the population, with shares revolving around 20% in each of the five quintiles of wealth. And the same is true for deposit holdings. Uh, on the other hand, owning other properties other than the main residence is uh, increasing in wealth, and uh, specifically, the percentage of households who hold an additional property is 3% for the first quintile of wealth. Uh, and this share increases to 44% for people belonging to, upper to the upper tail of the distribution. Also, the share of households reporting to have self-employment business value is the most uh, unequally distributed assets, um, as you can see from the graph. Around 1.5% of households in the bottom quintile against 57% uh, of households in the top quintile. Uh, we can now switch to liabilities to debt. Uh, these include loans, so maybe for a house or for a car purchase, and also all other type of debts like credit cards. We find that around one third of Maltese households hold some form of debt, and that around 24% of households reply to possess uh, mortgage debt, mainly for loans on the primary residence, which makes sense considering uh, what we have been saying so far as well. In terms of the composition, mortgage debt represents almost 90% of total liabilities, of which again that for the main residents represents the last represents the largest shares at around 72%. Non-mortgage debt constitutes the smallest share of total debt instead of just below 12%. Uh, looking at the bar chart on the left hand side, the median debt level rose from uh, 40,000 in 2017 to 45,000 euros in 2020. The median outstanding balance of the loan on the household main residence instead decreased by almost 20% across the last two waves, while that on other property increased by 30%. And uh, the value of other non mortgage debt uh, remained pretty stable over time. Sorry. So similar to what previously shown for assets, in this slide we can see the population structure for the main components of liabilities according to the distribution of wealth. Uh, mortgages on the primary residence are concentrated in the second quintile. We find in 2020 where almost 40% of households replied to hold this kind of debt. And also consistently with what we have uh, found when looking at uh, when analyzing assets, the loans on other properties other than the main residence, so the loans on, from holding a secondary second property is increasing in wealth. Uh, that is the share of households with a loan on a second home is less than 1% for the 
for the first quintile of wealth, and it increases to almost 60% uh, for people belonging to the upper tail of the distribution. As for other non-mortgage debt, the distribution is less asymmetrical with a higher concentration around the, the middle class. Uh, now, uh, we can now turn our attention to some results uh, stemming from the additional COVID module. Uh, this was uh, basically there were three questions included uh, in the last wave uh, due to the pandemic, obviously. And this question were, uh, were asked uh, to assess to what extent the pandemic affected households' financial situation. One of the questions studies the impact of COVID on the labor status of households, and specifically households were asked if any member experienced any change in the labor market status. Here you can see uh, the percentage of households who replied yes to one of these options. So basically, the top part was the question in the survey, and those were the options uh, households could choose from, and respondents could choose uh, multiple of, of these, so it wasn't... Uh, and here we report the percentage of households who replied yes to, to each of these uh, given answers. Uh, in total, we can see that, that there were 30% households who replied yes to any of these. And it's implying that around three quarters of the responses stated that they had not been affected by the pandemic in terms of employment at least. Out of these 30% of responses who replied that their labor status had been impacted, uh, we find around 15% of responses was able to keep their job, but with a temporary reduction in wage. Uh, another 6% had to quit their job, was laid off or closed their business, and almost 5% kept their job but temporarily lost all of their income. Then uh, we're not showing it here, but uh, the percentage of people who lost their job on or closed their business due to COVID was overall uh, widespread, overall widespread across all education levels, age groups, labor like states, and income quintiles. And a full income loss while keeping the job was mostly experienced by self-employed, while 47% of self-employed responded experienced a partial income loss. The sector with the highest job loss, uh, as expected for obvious reasons, uh, was the accommodation and food services sector, sectors, followed by other services, which includes various non extensions like, for example, uh, hairdressers and so on, which were forced to temporarily close their business during the pandemic. The next question in this module asked the, if the household experienced a change in income due to the pandemic, and if yes, by how much? Like again, like in the previous slide, uh, on top we have the question you can find in the questionnaire, and these were the, the replies here, they, it was selective, so you could only choose one of the options. Uh, here we, you can see that you can, uh, basically you have either decrease, increase, or remain the same, but we also had in detail it, by how much it decreased. Now, over 70% of the interviewed population said that their income remained unchanged. And this was possible to, to state aid schemes such as the wage supplement Im implemented that was intended to safeguard household income for those whose jobs were mostly impacted by the pandemic related lockdowns and containment measures. But despite these measures, around 26% reported a lower income. So this is the sum of the dark blue, uh, orange and gray slices in the pie chart, with most households replying that the reduction was between 5 and 25%. Uh, households were then asked how did they compensate in case of a loss in income, and the majority of interviewed households, which this would be around 70%, replied that they have lowered their expenditure on food clothes, traveling, and other consumer goods and services in order to cope with the reduction in income. Uh, another 34% of households noted that they have used savings and unsold financial assets, while 9% deferred on loan or rent payments to overcome the loss in income. Uh, to sum up, uh, today we discussed the core topics of the HSCFs, so I give you a brief overview of the main uh, topics, namely the balance, uh, balance, balance sheet situation of the Maltese households, uh, which is the, the major contribution of the survey. Nonetheless, I would like to conclude this presentation by mentioning some other topics covered by the HSCS, which I wasn't able to go through 
for time constraints, but I would consider interesting for research and are also important from a policy perspective. Uh, I didn't mention the demographic structures, but obviously we have the, all the social demographic um, characteristics also, so age, gender, employment, and so on support. And these are pretty much uh, consistent with other similar surveys, like for example, Silk. Uh, we could also look at how the labor status the composition affects other life aspects, what I mean just not by the conventional Iskonis way, but maybe given the times we're living in, it would be interesting to differentiate between in-person workers from those whose job allows to work from home. Uh, we talked about income briefly, but we also ask households about future income expectations, and this can also be connected to another question we have about life satisfaction. Uh, we also have information on consumption. We didn't cover it in this presentation, but we have consumption of food, utilities and holidays. And from combining data and then on income and consumption, we can derive a household's ultimately ability to save. Also, we have data on gifts and inheritance received, which for Malta, it's not negligible, I have to say, and of what sort, like uh, how many, or of what type, like cash, properties and the value. We collect information on credit cost rates by asking if households applied for credit in the last three years, and if not, uh, and I'm sorry, and if they applied, if they were refused credit or they were uh, accepted. In the same way, we distinguish between real and financial assets. We could also split wealth into liquid and in and in liquid. This is very uh, it's a very modern way to look at it. It's grown uh, in attention in this topic. Um, we can also derive as an example, we have the value, we can compile the value per square meter of the main residence. Uh, and also from the data on that assets and income, we are able to compile various debt burden indicators, which allow to assess the sustainability of households financial situation and are important for uh, policy making as well. And finally, uh, where the number of observations allow for it, we have a question on, on district, uh, which district you belong and live in. So we can compute statistics at regional level or even up to regional or district level. And that's all from my end. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Valentina, for this very interesting presentation. May I remind uh, the audience that some of the preliminary results presented here by Valentina are available in one of the articles in this year's research bulletin. So I see a hand raised by Manuel. Yes, um, first of all, thank you very much for this very very extensive presentation of, of, of the survey. I have a, a, a couple of questions. Um, this uh, this happened all in a scenario when interest rates were very, very low. And also, um, in a way, people were, were looking for returns and they started investing even more on property. Now that this sort this sort of scenario is, is, is about to change or is changing already, how do this do, do you think is going to impact on on buying of property, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Second, um, have you noticed an increase in in rent income because of this uh, of this particular um, tendency to to buy property to rent it out for other people? Um, third, when you say wealth, do you also include like where covarts and yachts or um, these these very expensive boats that it seems that we there is a lot of 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 um, business going around. And last, um, when you say property, do you also include property of Maltese um, that is that, that is overseas, like you know when they buy property in in Italy or or some or Estonia or some or Bulgaria? This kind of wealth is it included in this kind of of survey? Thank you. OK, thank you, Manu. So I'll try to answer to all of your questions. Let, so let me proceed by, uh, let me start. So regarding the um, the increase in the, in the interest rates that, that we are experiencing right now, 
Um, I'm not sure uh, I'm in a position to answer or not, because like uh, like you said, uh, interest rates in Malta, specifically inflation, has been uh, have been stable for many many years, so it's hard to to predict. I don't think this will have a lot of uh, an impact actually on the acquisition on the buying of properties locally uh, by Maltese uh, the Maltese population. I think we still have to see, but uh, obviously to to maybe help answer your question a bit better, I think it will maybe uh, be taken into consideration when we're designing the next wave of the questionnaire, which will happen next year. We will be running in 2023. There will be the next wave of the questionnaire. I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, were to include maybe a question, because there is already a question like on future expectations of income or the, the value of your property. So we might include maybe uh, a question on, on the interest rates given the, the, the situation. Uh, for as far as, I um, don't know, Brian, you wanted to say something? No. Okay. No, I thought you were. Okay. And as far as uh, the question regarding um, the Maltese property is uh, abroad, so uh, basically since it's only part but yes, so assets and liabilities held abroad by Maltese households are included in the questionnaire, while what is excluded uh, is the one held in Malta by non-domestic households. So yes, if you own a, a property abroad, it will be included. Uh, regarding art, yes, it, 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 uh, it makes far, part of valuables. And regarding the the rent on income, well, I'm sorry, I'm just double checking uh, the figures. Uh, yes, there has been uh, we do we do see uh, a slight increase across the waves across all the years, uh, not too drastic, but there is a trend, an increasing trend. Yes, I hope I answered. Feel free to. Yes. Okay. Thank helped. you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Valentina, you, you mentioned uh, that the field work took place during the, the COVID period and especially you had to switch from face to face uh, to, to telephone interviews. Uh, did you encounter any more difficulties during because of the because of the pandemic? And does this make it difficult uh, to compare with the with the previous results? Okay, thanks, Brian. No, so actually, we we were uh, fearing that this might have an impact actually on the field work, but uh, in our case, and uh, there, we weren't it, field work wasn't much impacted. So field work was supposed to start uh, to start in October, and it was postponed to almost end of November. Uh, but apart from that, uh, also considering that in Malta we were fairly lucky as far as the pandemic uh, actually severity went and also due to the the good uh, reputation that the NSO has basically we didn't encounter any any major difficulties between stitching from in person to telephone interviews there was a slight drop in the response rate between this wave and the previous wave but we actually double checked with our colleagues at the national statistics office and this wasn't due to the switch in the mode of the interview but it was mostly due to um the grafting of the sample so much more technical details so no we weren't impacted much obviously this is to say that still uh it touches very sensitive topics and it's quite a lengthy questionnaire so by the end of the interview uh, respondents are a bit tired so obviously on the phone makes a bit of different difference ultimately but uh probably for the next wave will be a mix mode so definitely it's hard to envisage that we're gonna go back to face-to-face -face interviews i don't see any more hands raised uh, so if there are no more comments 
Uh, this will bring us to the to the end of the workshop. Uh, thank you, Valentina, and may I also thank the audience for attending. It's been a very interesting morning, and I hope that next year we will be able to organize the event in person. Uh, we will be uploading the bulletin soon on the website or at the, at the four articles, but I will also encourage you to browse through our economic webpage uh, where you'll find several publications from articles and short boxes uh, to policy notes, working papers and studies in external journals. Uh, before concluding, I want to thank the communications and public relations team uh, for their assistance. Moira and Debbie with the bulletin, Rose with the organization of the workshop and Veronica with the creation of the visuals and videos for social media. Also, thanks to the speakers for their interesting insights. The governor of the Central Bank of Malta, Professor Edward Cicluna, Elisa Lanzi, Noel Rapa, Massimo Giovannini and Valentina Antonaroli. So thank you again. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us today and goodbye. Thank you, Brian. Well done.